welcome. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I know some of us went curling yesterday a little bit sore. If I start grimacing while I'm up here, uh, it's because I'm a little bit sore. I have an excuse. I'm old. Uh, I don't know why some of these younger guys were complaining that they're sore from curling of all things. But uh, yeah, for those who didn't come, it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, Hopefully next time you guys can make it. But let's continue in prayer. And can you guys fix my mic? I feel like I sound funny. Am I okay? Or is this just my normal voice? My voice always sound funny? All right, let's pray. Lord, what an amazing God you are and what a privilege it is to be here among brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship you, to give all glory and honor and praise to you. What a privilege and honor it is to know that we are loved by you and that you call us your beloved. So Lord, as we've come, we know that you are here. We pray that you would just reveal more of yourself to us here in this place, that you would stir in our hearts and our minds that you would stir in us a hunger and a desire to know you and love you more, and that you would speak and move. Lord, help us to get out of the way of what you are doing and help us to let you do your thing here in our hearts and our minds and our lives. May we be changed for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The church in Sardis was an oxymoron. In one way, it was a live, thriving church, but yet in another way, it's dead. Physically, it's a church that is alive. It's the biggest of the seven churches that Jesus writes to. It's the richest of those seven churches. Yet Jesus, in verse 1, says himself that they are dead. Spiritually, they are a dead church. Maybe it was a church going through the motions. Maybe it was a church... I was more concerned about money than about people. We don't know for sure what exactly was going on in that church. But we know that it was so bad that Jesus calls them spiritually dead. But at the same time, it's not so bad that they're beyond hope. Remember, the God who conquered sin and death on the cross at Calvary can conquer our spiritual death. And it's the same God who says to this church that he calls, says is spiritually dead in verse 1. Who turns around and says in verse 2, wake up. In other words, it's not too late. Wake up. You guys are spiritually dead, but wake up. You guys can still turn around. But they have to act immediately. They can't sit back and wait. They can't afford to wait and gamble. They need to act now. So then how do we, or they as a church, how do we fend off spiritual death? Or how do we, hopefully not, but how do we, if we need to, come back from spiritual death? Jesus gives five commands in these five short verses. First, he says, wake up. Jesus, wake up twice in this passage in verse 2 and verse 3. But something's lost in translation. NIV, ESV, most of the major translations translate it as wake up in this particular passage. In Revelation 3, they translate it as wake up. But most of the other times in the New Testament, when that same Greek word is used, it's actually translated as keep watch. So in Mark 14, 34, when Jesus and the disciples, Jesus in the garden, he's telling the disciples to stay and pray. He says to them, verse 34 says, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Keep watch. Be on the lookout for the enemy. Because the temptation is for us to be lazy. It's for us to become complacent in our faith. The temptation is for us to think, ah, we're okay. I don't need to do any more. I can just kind of rest on my laurels and stay where I am. Remember I said last week that this is the largest of the seven churches that Jesus wrote to and the, lo- and the wealthiest. So at some point, it makes sense that this church, the people in this church, were probably doing something right. At some point in time, this church was probably doing s- things right. But somewhere along the line, they got lazy. 
somewhere along the line, they got complacent. Somewhere along the line, they started living in their past, thinking about the glory days and the good things that they had gone through and just kind of stayed there. And somewhere along the way, they got lazy. And as they got lazy, they didn't keep an eye out for Satan. They didn't keep an eye out for people who were coming in with false teachings and trying to lead them astray. And so where they end up is spiritually dead. A church that was once thriving and alive, now spiritually dead. And to this church in Sardis, Jesus' words probably hit twice as hard. Because not only did this church go from being alive and thriving, but if you remember last week, I said that the city of Sardis, Sardis thought they were impenetrable. The city of Sardis was built on a mountain, and they thought that they had a military advantage over anybody who would dare to come and attack them. They got cocky. They thought that nobody would dare come, and even if they did, there was no way they could come and take them over while they were at the top of this mountain. But historians tell us that the city actually fell to their enemies twice. Not once, but twice the city fell. Why? Because they didn't keep watch. Because they got lazy. They were complacent. Because they weren't diligent. They thought they were impenetrable. And the other armies realized they've got a strategic advantage. So the armies that came, the two times that they fell, they didn't, the armies didn't come and straight out attack them. What they did was they sent spies. In 549 BC, Cyrus captured the city by sending a climber up a crevice in the wall, one of the walls, one of the fortress walls. He sent somebody in snuck one person in and again in 218 bc antiochus the great sent a party of 15 men who sneaked up into the wall into the fortress and opened the gates from within twice in the history of this city they fell because they got lazy they fell because instead of realizing they needed to stand watch and watch out for any enemies that might come they thought they were they had it all they thought they were the bomb they thought, we're up here, there's no way anyone's going to attack. And in their laziness, in their complacency, enemies snuck in. Enemies snuck in and did the damage from the inside. And twice the city fell because of their laziness, because of their complacency. So as Jesus says, keep watch. I imagine the church in Sardis, Remembering their history. They can't be lazy in their faith. They can't get complacent in their faith thinking, this is good enough. I don't need to do anything more. I can just sit here and enjoy what's going on. Because the minute we sit back and relax, that's when Satan start, tries to sneak in. So Jesus says, keep watch. Wake up. Keep watch. Be diligent in your faith and go deeper. Second command, so Jesus says, is strengthen what remains. Remember, this is a church that at some point was probably doing some things right. By now, by the time Jesus writes to them, most of what they're doing is wrong. But at some point, they were doing some things right. At some point, they became the largest and richest church because they were doing something right. So Jesus is telling them, hold on, strengthen what remains. Hold on to those things that you are still doing right. Those few things that you guys are doing right, hold on to them. Cling to them. Don't let them go. Don't throw the good out with the bad. Get rid of the bad. But strengthen those things that you are doing well. Keep watch over the evil one. Keep watch for the evil one and hold on to the good. The good could be programs. Sometimes churches set up great programs that are doing God's work. I know of a couple churches in, in the area that do an outreach to autistic kids. People in the church give up their time and energy to re 
reach autistic kids in the community. Sometimes it's programs that are the good. Or the good could be practices that we've gotten into, like meeting together and praying together, encouraging each other, spurring each other on to love and good deeds, worshiping God together, or hopefully reading scripture daily, praying together, praying daily. The good can be practices that we've had instilled in us or we've grown up with. Or the good could be those who are not yet spiritually dead in that congregation. In verse 4, Jesus says, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not spoiled their clothes. Jesus could be telling them, Strengthen those who have been faithful. Those of you who have fallen, don't think you guys can pick yourselves up and start all over. Strengthen those who have been faithful. Turn the leadership over to them and build with them. Jesus is telling the people, build on the good that's in your church. Whether it's programs, practices, or people, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to throw everything out and start over. You guys built a decent foundation at one point, but you guys got lost. So use that foundation. Strengthen what you have and build on it. When we wander away from Christ, usually there's a solid, decent foundation that we've laid in our lives. But because of situation, circumstances, we wander away. Don't throw everything out and think you have to start over from scratch. Throw out the crap that you've picked up along the way. Build on the good that is there. Build on the good foundation that was built. Strengthen what remains. Jesus' third command. Remember what you have received and heard. Remember what you have received and heard. We can't live in our past glories. This church can't live in the things they did in the past the things that got them to be the biggest and richest church of the seven churches. But at the same time, they can't forget the things that got them there either. They need to remember. Remember what they've learned about Jesus, but also remember what Christ has done in their lives to get them to this point. We can't forget we, must, we have to remember what Christ has done in our lives. Not just his death and resurrection, but in the personal encounters that we've had. In what's brought us to this point in our faith. Most of us don't come to church because we have nothing better to do on Sunday. We come because we know Christ. Maybe we've fallen away at some point, but we come because at some point we knew Christ and we fell in love with him. Jesus is saying, remember. Remember what you've received and heard. Remember what you've learned about Christ. But also, remember your encounters with Christ. Remember his love for you. Remember his grace for you. Remember what he's done in your life. We can't live off the past. We can't think that, wow, back when I was younger, I had this great thriving relationship with him, with Christ, but now it's not very good, but that's okay because it was so good in the past. We can't live like that. But at the same time, we need to remember the past, the things from the past. Remember, We need to remember what Christ has done, especially when we're spiritually dying, especially when things are tough, when we want to quit, when we want to run from Christ. We need to remember what he has done for us so that we can be strengthened, so that we can come back. It's usually in the times when we're struggling and suffering that we need to remember Christ the most because it's in those times that we get encouraged, we get strengthened. I remember in past and other times when I struggle, If I go back and read my journal, reading some of the things, reading over some of the things that Christ has done in my life, it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. How 
can I question Christ with, oh yeah, he did this and this and this. Wow. What was I thinking doubting Christ when I've got a record of all these things that he's done? That's why Christ says, remember what you've received and heard. When times are tough, when you're struggling, remember what he's done. His next command is hold it fast. ESV translates it, keep it. Cling to what you are remembering. Cling to what you've received and heard. Not just think about it and forget about it, which we have a tendency of doing a lot of times, but cling to it. Cling to, to it so that we remember in those hard times. So that we don't have to go back and read the journal, but that we remember automatically, oh yeah, why am I doubting and questioning Christ when these are the things that he has done for me? When I have seen him work in these amazing ways, how can I question him? Keep it. Keep it in your heart. Keep it in your mind constantly. Jesus is saying, keep it so you don't forget. And his last command, repent. Repent. Turn back to Christ. The good thing about their situation, if there is a good thing, is that at one point they knew Christ. At one point they knew Christ before they became spiritually dead. So Jesus is saying, turn back. Repent. Come back to him. It's not... Go and come find something completely new that you don't know anything about. Come back to the one you know. Come back to the one who, who you know loves you, whose love you have known. Jesus is saying, turn back from the evil that's invaded your church. Turn back from tolerance and complacency that's infiltrated the church. And turn back to Christ. Repent. I think there's a temptation to hear these words, to hear Jesus' command and think, you know what? I can do this later. I don't have the time right now. I've got exams. I've got final projects, assignments. I've got work. I've got things that I need to do. I need to take care of my kids. I need to take care of my house. I need to do all of these other things. I can do this later. Jesus, I love you but you're going to have to wait a little bit because I don't have time right now. I can do this later. But in reality, there's, actually, there's immediacy in Jesus' words. This isn't something that can wait till later. This is something that needs to happen now. The church in Sardis is spiritually dead, yet it's not too late to come back to Christ. But a time is coming where if they don't wake up, it will be too late. Jesus says in verse 3, But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what, at what time I will come to you. We can think that I've got time. I can do this later. I can go deeper in my relationship with Christ later some other time when I've got more time. But right now, I've got other things I need to worry about. But the reality is, we don't know. We don't know when Christ is coming. We don't know when our lives may end. We don't know when it may be too late because we've been spiritually dead for too long. We just don't know. Do you really want to gamble? I've heard stories of people who say they like Christianity. They say, I like Christianity. I like a lot of it. But then they say, and they also say, I, I definitely want to go to heaven. But then they say, but you know what? I'm going to believe in Jesus on my deathbed. Because I don't really like this whole idea of holiness and purity, of living a holy and clean life for Jesus. So I'm going to do all the things that I want now while I'm living. And then on my deathbed, before I die, I'm going to accept Jesus as my Savior then. They think that they can just wait until later, make a deathbed confession, and everything will be fine. And who knows? Maybe some of them will be able to. 
Maybe some of them will be able to live out this plan of doing whatever they want now and then on their deathbed say, Jesus, I love you. Come into my life. But who knows? Maybe their life will end just tomorrow, in a week, in a month, by accident, all of a sudden, without a chance for them to make a deathbed confession. They're gambling with their salvation. They're gambling that they'll have a chance to do whatever they want and then confess Jesus as their Savior before they die. But more so than gambling with whether that chance will occur or not, is they're missing out now. They're missing out on a relationship with Christ now. Sure, they're thinking about having that relationship with Jesus in the future, but because they're only looking to the future, they're missing out on knowing Christ here and now. Maybe you're thinking, I'll start going deeper in my faith tomorrow, or I'll start going deeper in my faith in a couple of weeks, or once all the stuff in my life, all this craziness in my life is done. Maybe you're saying, God, once I finish everything, once I get rid of my exams and everything else, you know, once you help me do well on my exams and pass all my courses, and once you help me get a job, and once you help me do all this other stuff, then Jesus, at that point, once everything else is straightened out, I'll go deeper with you. Maybe you're gambling. Maybe you're gambling, thinking, I don't need to go deeper now because I can always do it later. Because I have so much time later, after all of this other stuff is done, to go deeper with Jesus then, that I don't have to do it right now. But the reality is, we never know. We never know if Christ is going to come back tomorrow. We never know if we're going to all of a sudden die in a couple of weeks. We never know if we will get a chance later to go deeper. So why not start now? I'd be willing to bet if you're making those excuses saying, Jesus, I'll do it later when I have time. I'd be willing to bet when later rolls around, you still won't have time. More so, more so than maybe it being too late later. By waiting, by thinking we can do it later, we're missing out on relationship with Jesus now. We're missing out on knowing Christ and loving Christ and being loved by Christ so much right now. I know some of you guys are crazy how I met your mother fans so if I'm kind of wrong in this reference forgive me from what I remember this is how it happened but my memory is going my hair went then my eyes went now my memory is going but from what I remember there's an episode in how I met your mother and for those who don't know what how I met your mother is it's dad a dad telling his two kids teenage kids how he met their mother but to get to the story of how he met their mother he's going through all these other stories of things that happened in his life but from one of the episodes that I remember he actually sees his mother they don't show us but he sees his mother and he goes and knocks on the door and says hi something like hi I know I'm going to meet you in two weeks but I didn't want to wait those two weeks I wanted to spend as much time with you as I could, so I wanted to come and say hi now. We should be like that with Christ. Sure, we can wait a week, two weeks, a month, five months. Christ will wait for us. But why wait? We should want to be in relationship with Christ now. We should want to be going deeper with him now instead of waiting. Yes, we can meet in a week or two weeks or a month. But we should want to know him so much that we want to go deeper right now and get to know him right now. We should want to start enjoying a deeper, stronger relationship with Christ instead of waiting until we get to heaven. He's giving us 
he gave the church in Sardis an opportunity to come back, to go deeper. He tells them they're dead and turns around and says, wake up, come back. And he's giving us an opportunity, regardless of where we are, to go deeper in our relationship with him. What a privilege. What a joy. What an amazing thing to know Christ here and now. To enjoy him now here on earth, even before we get to heaven. And he gives us that opportunity. Christian life starts with relationship. Relationship with Christ. Everything else needs to come out of that relationship. If it doesn't come out of that relationship, that's when we're spiritually dead. When we start doing all of these things to impress people. When we start coming to church because we have to. Instead of coming because we enjoy being enjoy our relationship with Christ. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be like the church in Sardis. I don't want to be like the church in Sardis, busy doing all of these things, yet pushing the relationship with Christ to the back. Pushing the relationship with Christ to the back burner so that he says that we're spiritually dead. I don't want to be like the church in Sardis. Maybe it's time for us to start going deeper now. Maybe it's time for us to start going deeper with Christ here, today, right now. Instead of waiting a week, a month, six months, a year. Maybe it's time to go deeper with Christ and get rid of our spiritual death. Stop dying spiritually and start thriving and start living in relationship with Christ. Lord, I don't want to be like the church in Sardis dying. I don't want to be an oxymoron. I don't want to look like I'm alive and thriving, but spiritually dying inside, Lord. I want to be alive with you. I want to enjoy you in my life every day, every moment. I don't want to wait for a month or a year or whatever to start going deeper, Lord. I want to enjoy you every day, every moment. Let that be our prayer in our hearts, in our minds, instead of waiting and saying we don't have time. Help us to realize we don't want to spend time without you. We want to go deeper and know you and love you and be loved by you. Lord, help us not to be spiritually dead, but help us to be alive in you, to thrive in you, to know you, and love you and call you Savior and to be called your beloved. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name.